I've been studying bumblebees as a, as a scientist in the university for um, 20-something years now. Um, uh, and I'm going to focus ma mainly on bumblebees, which are my kind of pet subject tonight. Um, but before I do, um, I just wanted to kind of talk briefly about the, the diversity of, of bees, because I don't think many people have any idea how many different ones there are. Um, in fact, I think a lot of people out there think there's one species of bee, and it lives in a box, and it makes honey. Um, but if you ask them to draw a bee, uh, they'll draw something that's big and round and has yellow and black stripes. Um, and what they're drawing is, is actually a bumblebee rather than a honeybee. So the honeybee is, is the thing on the left there, I'm sure you, you'd all recognize. It actually doesn't really have much in the way of stripes. Um, the bumblebee is more of a sort of the, the big furry cartoon bee, much larger than a, than a honeybee. Um, but then there are a whole load of other bees that get forgotten. Um, as it says up there, about 4,000 species of bee in the United States, in North America, I should say, and about 20,000 species of bee in the world. Um, and most of them never get mentioned, get any attention. In fact, I've seen whole documentaries about bees on television where they, they only ever mention one species the whole way through, which makes me really angry. Like, Come on. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm just going to show you a few, few pictures to start with of bees you've probably never seen before. Um, so they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. That's perhaps one of the more conventional ones. Uh, there are some that you would probably mistake for a wasp. It's actually a bee. It's a cuckoo bee. Um, that, uh, cook, there, are, there are lots of species. Of, about a quarter of all those 20,000 species of bee that we know of are actually cuckoos. So they specialize in sneaking their eggs into the nests of other bees uh, rather than bothering to gather their own uh, reward, uh, food. Uh, but it's, it's still a bee. Um, there are beautiful things like this blue-banded uh, Amagilla bee. Um, there are, th this is a really interesting behavior. You see um, some solitary bees. So, so the bulk of these 20,000 species, they live on their own. They don't live in a hive with a queen. Um, they live out their, their lives on their own. The female just makes a little burrow and fills it with, with pollen and lays eggs in it. Um, and, so, and so they don't have anywhere to go at night, most of them. Uh, and so, and so they'll have to sleep out, and they, find that they have to find somewhere safe to sleep. And quite a few of them will do what this one's done. So it's just found a, a little twig on the end of a branch, and it's just bitten on with its mandibles, and then it curls up its legs, and it's just sitting there, just attached by its mandibles to the end of a twig, and it, the next morning it'll fly off again. There are these fantastic things. You don't get them here, sadly. These, this is an orchid bee. You get them in Florida uh, and Central America. Absolutely beautiful things. Uh, and also rather, rather kind of weird, intriguing. They're primitively social. They're, they're just kind of that transition between living on their own and living in social groups. And they also have, they, they're tip, this, these orchid bees, there's lots of different species, but they all, the males all have giant back legs, um, which are actually hollow. Um, and they stuff them full of the scent from a particular species of orchid. And each orchid bee has a particular species of orchid that it gathers the scent from. And once its legs are full of the scent, it can then go and it uses that scent to, to, to woo female orchid bees, um, uh, which, yeah, fascinating beasties. Um, there are also things that look like bees, um, but actually aren't bees, to the huge embarrassment of the authors of this book. Um, <laughs> so, so, so that's actually a fly. In fact, to be fair, that's not one of the best mimics of bees. There are some flies that look really like bees. That one actually looks pretty much like a fly to me. <laughs> but anyway, um, the, the, to be absolutely fair to the authors of the book, they didn't get to see the jacket before the publishers printed something like 5,000 copies, which uh, must have been somewhat annoying. Anyway, um, so these, these are my favorites. This is what I study. Uh, bumblebees. There are about 250 species in the world. You've got 46, I think, or thereabouts. Um, lovely, big, furry bees. Uh, they all belong to one genus. It's called Bombus. Um, they're, they're social bees, so they're more like the honeybee than those solitary bees. They have, a, they have an annual life cycle, though, so um, at this time of year, it's just finishing, but if, if we follow it from the spring, in the spring you see these giant furry bees coming up from out of the ground. We probably don't see them coming up, but you'll see them flying about. They're queen bees that have been asleep over the winter. Um, and they're looking for some, somewhere to nest. They nest in little, usually in holes in the ground, often old mouse holes. Um, and they need to find down that hole an old rodent nest with insulation that they can build their own nest inside. 
Um, so that's where they normally nest. And if they find that, they build a little ball of pollen and they lay their eggs in it and they incubate it just like a, a, a bird, which is something that most people don't know. People think that um, insects are cold-blooded, but some insects, um, some of the big ones like bumblebees, are actually essentially warm-blooded. They, I'll say more about that in a minute. Anyway, they incubate their eggs and those eggs hope eventually hatch into little grubs which develop into, into worker bees, which are daughters smaller miniature versions of the queen and they then take over the foraging and the nest grows through the spring might get up to having a couple of hundred workers by um, July and then it switches to producing new queens and males and the males don't do anything but mate they don't collect any food for the nest they're lazy if you like um, but they do have one important job which is to find themselves a, a young virgin queen and mate with her um, and uh, she just mates once, when she's very young, just with one male, and as soon as she's mated, she burrows into the ground, it might be as early as June or July, and sleeps through to the next spring. And everything else dies off. Um, it's kind of sad, actually, that so male, that for reasons no one's ever worked out, there are about seven times as many male bumblebees born as new queens, um, which when you think about it means that six out of seven male bumblebees never get to do the only thing that they were born to do, which is kind of depressing, but anyway. Um, but, so, so, but then the, so the old nest, the old queen, the males, the old workers, they all die off at this time of year. And, and that, the only things alive now would be these young queens that mated sitting underground waiting for next spring. I said this thing about bumblebees being, being kind of warm-blooded. Um, they they're really unusual insects in that they thrive in cold climates. So most insects get more common. There's more species as you go southwards. Um, uh, things like butterflies, dragonflies, grasshoppers, whatever you might think of, um, that, that would be true. But for bumblebees, it's not true. And so this rather odd diagram shows you where in the world um, bumblebees live. And the more species live there, the darker the color. So actually, if you wanted to go and, and um, on a, a holiday just to see bumblebees, which I'm sure you wouldn't, but just suppose you did, um, there's, there's up here, right there, which is sort of eastern, the eastern Himalayas somewhere. There's a number 60. That's the place with the most bumblebees in the world. And we think it's where bumblebees originated or somewhere around there about 30 million years ago. So the first bees appeared about 120 million years ago, back in the age of the dinosaurs. Um, we've got, we've got um, uh, bees trapped in amber from about 90 million years ago. Um, but bumblebees came later when the earth was a bit cooler, about 30 million years ago after the dinosaurs had all gone. And we think they originated there, and they spread um, west to Europe and east through Siberia into North America. And then some of them made it right down through the mountains of Central America and into South America, which is the only place where they naturally occur in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but essentially, they're, they're, they're cool weather creatures. Um, they're able to, to they produce heat internally by shivering their flight muscles. Um, and be, with being fairly big for insects and having the reason they're furry is to keep that heat in. And it enables them to do stuff like this. So, so this is a, it's a rubbish picture, I do apologize. But in the middle there, you can probably see a bumblebee. And that's snow on the, on, it's foraging in, in, uh, in um, late winter. Um, and the air temperature was just about freezing. But inside the bee, it's, in, it's body temperature is about 35 degrees centigrade. So they can keep their body temperature that much higher than the surrounding air, which is pretty amazing for a little, little creature. And this is an infrared picture. You can imagine this, this bee is being held in place with forceps. And so uh, imagine she's really angry and buzzing away. And you can see the thorax, the bit where the flight muscles are, it's sort of glowing white hot. So, so they, th that means they can live right up in the Arctic Circle and way up in, in the mountains and all sorts of places where other insects can't, can't do anything because it's too cold. But it comes at a huge cost. So it's very energetically expensive to keep warm um, when you're a small insect and generate all that heat. They, they, they flap their wings about 200 times a second to generate uh, heat. And if you try flapping your arms 200 times a second, you'll get very warm very quickly. Um, uh, but it, you'd also get very tired very quickly because it, it, it uses lots of energy. So someone once worked out that um, that a running man burns the calories in a Mars bar in about an hour of running, which is 
one of those kind of depressing statistics if you're running to lose weight. Um, um, if you happen to be a man-sized bumblebee, then you burn those calories in 30 seconds of flying, um, which would also be pretty exciting, wouldn't it? But um, anyway, so, so my point is, though, that they need, uh, they need loads of food to keep them going, which means they need lots of flowers, uh, and, and I'll come back to, to, to that in a minute. Um, oh, actually, before I go on to this, let me just read you a tiny bit from the only bit I'll read from one of my books. So this is my earliest memory of, of bumblebees, and, and it's important to note that I was only, I think, about six or seven when this happened. On one occasion, after a heavy summer rainstorm, I found a number of bedraggled bumblebees clinging to my buddleia and decided to dry them out. Unfortunately for the bees, I was perhaps a bit too young to have a good grasp of the practicalities. With hindsight, finding my mum's hairdryer and giving them a gentle blow dry might have been the most sensible option. Instead, I laid the torpid bees on the hot plate of the electric cooker, <laughs> covered them in a layer of tissue paper, and turned the hot plate onto low. Being young, I got bored of waiting for them to warm up and wandered off to feed my gerbils. Sadly, my attention didn't return to the bees until I noticed the smoke, the tissue paper had caught fire, and the poor bees had been frazzled. I felt terrible. My first foray into bumblebee conservation was a catastrophic disaster. <laughs> So, so those bees had run out of energy, basically. And, and if a bee hasn't got energy, she can't fly. And if she can't fly, she can't get to flowers. So what I should have done, actually, rather than burn them or blow dry them, um, was actually just give them some sugar water. And they'd have probably fired up their flight muscles and been fine, hindsight. Anyway, um, jumping on about 20-odd years in my life, um, when I first got interested in studying bumblebees, uh, when I noticed something kind of interesting. Um, I, was, I was sitting in a meadow um, uh, in the south of England watching bees flying around on <laughs> patches of flowers for very boring reasons. And, and I saw them doing something which anyone can see in their back garden, anywhere um, where there are bees, honeybees or bum uh, bumblebees or honeybees, they both do this. Uh, which is if you watch a bee, she flies from flower to flower, of course. Um, but she doesn't land on every flower. She often flies up to a flower, like this one is doing, with her antennae out, gets very close, but doesn't touch it, and, and then veers away at the last second. So a bee will go, often go to two or three flowers without actually landing on them before she settles on one and puts her, her tongue inside and drinks the nectar. And I thought, why is, what's, why is she doing that? What's wrong with the flowers that she's not landing on? Um, and it, it took about five years, and, and I, want, I had a, a PhD student, Jane Stout, who, who um, worked on this with me, to, to work out all the details of what was going on. And I'll cut a very long story very short. But it turns out that every time a bee touches a flower, she, she accidentally leaves a little smear of, of oils, oily hydrocarbons from her cuticle on the flower, just as when you or I touch a, a glass, um, we leave a fingerprint on, on the glass. We don't do it deliberately, but we do. And, and what bees do is they sniff the flowers for this faint whiff of the smelly footprint of a previous visitor. Uh, and if they can smell that a bee's been there recently, there's no point in landing because that previous visitor will have taken all the food. So they just save themselves what, maybe half a second they would otherwise have spent landing and putting their tongue into the flower. Um, which might not seem much, but if a bee is visiting maybe 10,000 flowers a day, then that adds up and it means that they're foraging that a little bit more efficiently than they would be otherwise, and they're less likely to run out of energy. They can take back more food to the nest and so on. Okay, so they visit lots of flowers um, to, to fuel um, uh, uh, their, their activities and to, to feed to their offspring and, and, and so on. Um, and that makes them really good pollinators. So um, different bees tend to pollinate different things, and, and I don't want to get into a fight about whose bees are best with any beekeepers that might be here. Honeybees are good at pollinating some things. They're famously good. For, they pollinate most of the almonds, for example, in California. Um, there are lots of things that they pollinate, but there are some things that honeybees are actually rubbish at pollinating, um, and some things that bumblebees are much better at. So, for example, things like runner beans. Um, honeybees don't visit at all because their tongues are too short to reach the nectar, so bumblebees are much better for those. Um, tomatoes. Um, are um, almost entirely pollinated by bumblebees because they have to be vibrated um, to get the pollen to come out the, of the anthers. And honeybees have never worked out 
how to do that. Um, uh, so, oddly, this is a strange statistic, but the, um, pretty much every tomato you've eaten since 1988 was pollinated specifically by a bumblebee, probably just one species of bumblebee, actually, which I'll come back to shortly. And uh, I worked this out the other day. This is an utterly stupid, useless statistic, but apparently there are roughly 10 trillion tomatoes grown every year, and most of them pollinated by bumblebees. Anyway, and they pollinate lots of other things, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, and so on, um, pollinated mainly by bumblebees. So, so they're doing something important, and we should, we should value them for it if we didn't just value them for being nice. Um, and so we should be really concerned that some of them are disappearing. Um, so um, if I first show you a, a UK species, this, this is a thing called the great yellow bumblebee, Bombus distinguendus, um, which used to be found all over Britain in the first half of the 20th century, um, but disappeared really rapidly during the 20th century, and, and now is only found in the wilds of the very far north and west of, of Scotland. But it isn't just happening here uh, in, in Britain, it's, it's happening elsewhere in the world. So far, we don't have fantastic data for lots of countries, but we've got pretty good data for the US, and you've seen some really dramatic declines in some of your species, some of which used to be very common. So this is one of those. This is a thing called Bombus affinis, the rusty patched bumblebee, uh, which in the eastern United States was one of the very commonest bumblebees. You, you could get hundreds of them in your back garden um, 20 or 30 years ago, but in, in the late 1990s, it just suddenly collapsed. Um, and this map tries to show you how the, but the red dots are essentially where it's, where it's now found, and the black, is where it, black and gray is where it used to be. Um, uh, so that's one of a, a number of species that's absolutely um, uh, had so something catastrophic has happened to it. Um, a relative of this species, bom uh, Franklin's bumblebee, um, fairly recently went extinct, closer to here actually, on the, the California-Oregon border. Um, that's the most recent global bumblebee extinction. It's gone from everywhere. That's it. It hasn't been seen since 2006, and I guess it's, that's, it's unlikely to be rediscovered. So something's going wrong with our poor bees. We'd really like to have better data on how fast they're declining. Um, we don't have a really good monitoring scheme to, to tell us what the population is doing, for, particularly for the common species. We have maps, like I've, I've just shown you, but they only tell you when something actually disappears. It would be better to have some sort of monitoring in, uh, of, 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 of numbers. And in fact, ideally what we'd have is a way of counting the nests of bumblebees. Um, because the nest is one breeding female, um, the queen, and, uh, and so that's actually probably the most useful measure of population size. And if we could count the number of nests and how it was changing over time, that would be fantastic. But it's not very easy because you can't find these darn nests. They're down little mouse holes in the ground. You occasionally stumble upon one in a compost heap or, or in your garden or whatever, but doing a systematic survey would be impossible. So we thought, well, we knew badgers sniff, sniff out bumblebee nests at night and eat the nests. They're one of the biggest predators in, in Britain. And we thought if badgers could sniff them out, then, then maybe dogs could sniff out bumblebee nests. And um, so we, we, one Friday afternoon after we'd been to the pub, we, we thought we'd ring the army and see if they'd train us a dog to find bumblebee nests, which we, we didn't realistically think that they would agree to. Um, they, not, they train loads of dogs. They have a whole dog training camp in the UK to, to send them off to, uh, to find explosives, landmines and, and things and get blown up, um, poor things. Well, hopefully not. But anyway, um, uh, but anyway they, so they said, yeah, we'll train you a dog to find bumblebee nests, much to our surprise. And uh, so they started training, training uh, this one. Um, this was Chad, the Mark I bumblebee sniffer dog. Um, actually, he was rubbish, and he was sacked from Bumblebee Sniffer Camp. Um, uh, and we, we got uh, Quinn, who was quite good. We had him for two years. Um, but he, 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 wasn't as, he, he spent his time in Scotland um, sniffing out great yellow bumblebee nests. And he did find quite a few, but he didn't seem to find as many as we thought he should be finding. So we eventually retired him and replaced him with Toby, uh, who was the best sniffer dog we ever had. That's Steph O'Connor, who did her PhD with Toby. Um, and they did find quite a lot of bumblebee nests, but, but again, it, wasn't as, it was all slightly disappointing because we put in a huge effort to keeping these dogs trained through the winter and so on. Um, and, and he would find tiny little bumblebee nests that we'd never otherwise have found. Um, but then he'd walk past a whopping great nest that we knew was there uh, without twitching his nose at all. And we had no idea what, what was 
why he would find some and not others, but he, he never really quite was the real deal. Um, and the funny thing was that Steph, after three years of trailing around behind this dog, became better at finding the nest than he was, um, at, at which point the dog kind of seemed redundant. So, um, so he was eventually retired too. Um, in fact, they both, they're, still, they're still together. They live in the wilds of, of Scotland on a farm now. But um, um, they did find some useful things, though. And th th I, so when they found nests, they put a camera on them, um, and they filmed them continually, 24 hours a day, until the nest died, so that we could find what happened to it. We could see whether it produced new queens, if it got eaten by a badger, uh, or whatever. Um, and we discovered all sorts of cool new things about, about bumblebee nests, which, uh, one of which I'm just going to show you if this works. So this is, a, this is a little bit of video. It's terrible quality footage. This is not, you know, BBC Natural History Unit. Um, but there is that little black dot down there is that that's, that's the entrance to a nest. And this here, with the, those are the white wings of a bee going into that hole. Um, and I'll just, I'll just show you what happens, assuming this works. And I apologize now for the music. <laughs> so another bee will come in the minute from the top. Sorry. <laughs> and there, there's the poor bee. So great, we call these things great tits. Um, uh, uh, we s you don't have the same species here. Um, are they called chickadees or something like that? What do you call? I don't know. Anyway, um, it's a common British bird, and it wasn't just a one-off. We had um, eight different nests that were staked out every day by a different, different one of these birds um, that would just come down and sit outside the nest and just pick off the, the bees one at a time. Um, and each bird had its own kind of way it had worked out of dismembering the bees. Um, so the most common was that they'd, they'd chip the top off the thorax and scoop out the flight muscles like eating a hard-boiled egg. And you get this little pile of identically dismembered bumblebees. And some of them would chop the bottom off and scoop the, scoop the contents out that way. Um, but yeah, so no one had ever seen that before. Um, <laughs> And uh, we thought that was rather cool and perfectly natural. I'm not suggesting we should start killing these things to save the bees or anything. Anyway, so why are they disappearing? What's, what are the problems? I, 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 I don't want to go on too long about this because it gets a bit depressing, but it, it is important. Um, so there's a number of problems that, that, that bees face, and I'm not gonna, I, I'll, I'll sort of whiz through them reasonably quickly, but they basically boil down to these four, I think, and these same pressures tend to affect lots of other creatures as well. So the biggest driver, it's certainly in Europe and, and I think probably all over the world, is essentially the way farming has changed. So these pictures here, you can't really see what that is on top right terribly well, but that's um, a, an old hay meadow um, uh, in Britain, uh, one of the few little bits of uh, old hay meadows that survived. Well, we used to have about 7 million acres of, of uh, flowery hay meadows in Britain, which were almost all, 98% of them were plowed up in the 20th century. And they were full of flowers and they were replaced by huge monocultures and, uh, of cereals or silage fields. Um, and s similar things have, have happened elsewhere in the world. So we've lost lots of habitat that used to have lots of flowers in it. And pretty obviously, if you're a bee, then that's, that's bad. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, then there are issues with disease, pesticides, and, and most recently, there's evidence emerged that climate change is really impacting on bumblebees. And you can see why from what I said earlier about their they're really well adapted to cold climates. They're big and furry um, to keep warm um, in cold climates, but they can't cope with hot weather. That's why they never got into Africa, but they couldn't, they couldn't cross the Sahara because it's too, it's too hot. Um, uh, and so obviously as the temperature warms, they're going to be in trouble. It's essentially they're wearing a big fur coat um, and they get heat stress. They essentially just, just get too warm and can't fly um, if the air temperature is too high. There's a recent study was just published that showed that, that the southern edges of bumblebee ranges in, in Europe and North America are all shifting, uh, have already shifted quite a long way northwards. Um, but the odd thing is that the northern edges haven't also shifted northwards, so their ranges are getting squashed from the bottom. Uh, and nobody really knows why the top edge hasn't moved, but it, it, it's bad news, clearly, for, for our for bumbles. Anyway, um, 
So th th just go back to the first point, agricultural intensification. This is an example of, of a flower-rich grassland of which we used to have in Europe tons and tons of this kind of habitat. And you also, in North America, used to have some really beautiful uh, uh, flower-rich habitats, a few of which survived, but an awful lot of which have been lost. So this is, this is from California, um, a really lovely example of, a, of, a, of, a, of one of your uh, native grasslands. But you can see what it's been replaced by in the distance there very largely. Um, and it's hardly surprising that if we, if we get rid of habitats like this and then replace them with stuff like this, then we won't just lose bees, we're going to lose most of our wildlife. Um, and huge chunks of the surface of the globe have been turned over into these vast fields of monoculture cropping with lots of pesticides applied. And it's kind of this Google Street View is quite a nice way of just browsing the world. Um, and it, but the sad thing is that there are so many places where you can drop down into Street View and it looks exactly the same. So this is, this is northern France, but that's, uh, I think that's Belgium. This is somewhere in uh, midwest of the United States. I, you, can, you can drop down in all sorts of places, and it all looks like this. It's pretty bleak, really. Um, it's a story for another day. I haven't really got time to go into, but I think there are big question marks over the sustainability of, of what we're doing. And certainly, I mean, we obviously need to grow food um, for people, um, but our wildlife is paying a huge price for the way we are growing food at the moment. Okay. Disease, this is probably something that fewer people know anything about. So, um, although they, they, you might well have heard of the varroa mite, and you certainly will have done if you're a beekeeper. Um, bees naturally have lots of diseases. All insects have lots of diseases. A um, whole range of things, viruses and bacteria and fungi, and then they have parasites as well. Um, but we've made things much worse for bees by moving them, uh, moving the bees and accidentally moving their, their diseases around the world. So. Honeybees aren't native to the Americas at all. Uh, we brought them here hundreds of years ago, and we accidentally brought a whole range of bee diseases with them in their hives. And they're not specific to honeybees, so once they were here, they happily jumped out into, into wild bees in North America. And, and obviously, we've taken honeybees all over the world, um, and we've taken uh, the full suite of honeybee diseases all over the world with them. And then more recently, we've started doing this since, since the 1980s, we've started doing the same with bumblebees which has made things even worse. So the reason this started um, is um, a Belgian guy in the 1980s, sorry, Dutch guy, I think, in the 1980s, um, worked out how to breed bumblebees in his garden shed on a, on a, a kind of efficient commercial scale. Uh, and he started, and the reason he, he was doing it because he, he'd worked out that he, the local tomato farmer who had a big glass house um, was having, he, the, the way that we, we used to pollinate tomatoes was, we, was um, the farmer would employ workers with vibrating wands to walk up and down buzzing all the tomato flowers manually because uh, they need to be shaken. I mentioned this earlier. To, they need to be buzzed by a bee or vibrated to get the pollen to come out. Um, and you can imagine the labor costs and what a boring job that must have been. And this guy realized that, of course, bees, bumblebees, do this very well, much better than people. And so he started breeding these bumblebees and supplying them to the, to the, to the local tomato grower. And he did, made, started making really good money, so he built a factory. And in no time at all, it, it, it turned into a huge international business where, where uh, in Europe alone, about two million bumblebee nests are reared every year and shipped out all over the world to anyone growing tomatoes. You have your own factories over here of, uh, of a, a North American species. But it means that these bees have been shipped all over the place. Um, uh, and the nests leaving these factories are almost all contaminated with, with at least one and often several um, bee diseases, which then jump into wild bees. And it's essentially the same as... So that really dramatic decline of the rusty-patched bumblebee in North America, we think, it hasn't been proven beyond doubt, but we think was because of a, a European disease being brought over with this trade in commercial bumblebees. And there's a terrible thing happening in South America at the moment where um, the Chilean government deliberately introduced European um, factory-reared bumblebees uh, to Chile um, in the 1990s. And they, again, did, they didn't check that they were free of disease. And it turns out they weren't. They were carrying some European diseases. And South American bumblebees, it turns out, have no resistance at all to European diseases, just as what happened with humans 500 years ago. Um, and so the South American bumblebees are being wiped out as we speak um, at, at a horrific rate by 
a plague of, of European bee diseases. Um, and it's all entirely avoidable. Uh, it's kind of crazy that, you know, in, in such recent years, we've been doing such stupid things. Anyway, um, diseases are causing all sorts of problems for, for, um, for bees, both honeybees and wild bumblebees and so on. And then I mentioned pesticides. I'm sorry to put up this awful slide. They always say, you know, don't put up slides that no one can read. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't put this up any other way. Um, so we use an awful lot of pesticides. And, and I know don't want to go too long on about this, but um, this is the, these are the pesticides that go onto one canola field uh, that we studied just near the university in, in the south of England. Um, the management in North America is very similar. Um, and so this just one crop, from when it was planted to when it was harvested, about 10 months later, gets 20 different pesticides applied to it, plus a couple of fertilizers. They've all got really interesting names. You probably can't read them, but sort of as ominous things like shadow and cruiser and dictate. And then Gandalf in the middle, which seems a bit mean, as Ga Gandalf has suddenly become an insecticide. But, um, but anyway, I, I would just say this, that, that, that um, if you were growing food to feed to your kids, would you put 20 different pesticides on it and then eat it or feed it to them? I, you, I think you probably wouldn't. Um, I certainly wouldn't. And yet, that's what's happening in farmers' fields all over. The Actually, if, if the list for an apple would be much, much longer. Um, horticultural crops are sprayed with much, much more, generally. Um, a really horrendous list of chemicals. Um, there's been a lot of interest in one particular group of pesticides and what impact they might be having on bees. And I got a whole talk on this, which, and, so, and I can't spend too long on it. Um, but I thought it would be I, worthwhile just touching on it, because probably a lot of you have heard of neonicotinoids, neonicotinoids, or however you pronounce it. Um, if you really want to hear the full version, there's a, there's a, on YouTube you can find me talking at the University of Plymouth um, earlier this year. Um, I'm going to give you the very short version. I mean, essentially these are neurotoxins that are uh, chemically related to nicotine that were invented in, in, in the late 1980s and commercially came on the market in the 1990s. And their, their v in use has increased very rapidly over time. That, that graph is for the UK, but it's, it would be the same for anywhere in the world. They prove really popular with farmers. Um, and particularly because the, they're very really easy to use. They're usually used as a seed dressing. So those, that, that blue stuff, they're canola seeds pre-dressed. So the farmer buys the seed pre-coated with insecticide, and he just sows it in the ground. He doesn't have to do anything at all. And, and they're water-soluble. They go into the soil, and then in theory, they get sucked up by the plant. And they're systemic, so they go to all parts of the plant um, and protect it against pests, which is what the farmer wants. Um, but the problem, well, part of the problem is that they also then go into the pollen and the nectar if it's a flowering crop. Um, and then they get eaten by bees. And these are neurotoxins, which attack the brains of insects. Bees need their brains, you'll be surprised to hear. Um, and um, so just, just to give you an indication of how poisonous they are, um, the toxicity of pesticides, of anything, is normally measured as an LD50, the lethal dose that kills 50% of your animals in a, in a test. And I've got two LD50s there, one for imidacloprid, which is a, one of these neonics, and the other one is for DDT, which you'll have all heard of as being a famously nasty chemical. But actually, as far as a bee is concerned, it's about six, six or so thousand times less toxic than one of these new generation neonics. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute we should go back to using DDT. But, um, so it takes four nanograms of, of neonic to, to give an, an LD50 to a bee. So 50-50 chance it'll die or live. And if it does live, it probably won't be very well. Um, so four, na four billionths of a gram, that means that one teaspoon, five grams, is enough to give an LD50 to one and a quarter billion honeybees. So it's incredibly toxic stuff. And just in the UK, we're applying about 100 metric tons to the landscape every year. And they're, they're quite persistent chemicals. We're finding them building up in soil, turning up in wildflower pollen, um, turning up in more or less anything you look in, turning up in streams very regularly. Um, it can't be good for the health of the environment to be putting persistent neurotoxins into it. Um, you can also buy them for use in your garden. Um, actually, you, can, you, you probably put them on the back of your dog or cat as well. There's stuff you drip on the neck. Um, the most common brand is, is a neonic. 
But also, the, I, I always put this up because it's kind of, I don't know whether it makes me laugh or cry, really, but this was a special promotion a couple of years ago in the UK that, uh, that Bayer put on with their, their bottle of bee-killing chemical. It came with free seeds for bees so that you could grow some lovely flowers and attract the bees and then kill them really effectively. Um, I don't know. They did pull it quite quickly. I think people thought it was perhaps taking the mickey slightly. Anyway, uh, to end the doom and gloom, um, these pictures show some um, farmers in southwest China. You might have seen these pictures before. They've been in the newspapers a bit. Um, they, show, they look quite pretty, don't they? But they sh they sh it's actually a really depressing sight because these people are hand-pollinating their apple and pears um, because there aren't any bees left in that part of the world. They've wiped them all out. Um, and, and clearly, you know, that's a pretty dire situation to be in. Um, and it's hard to imagine a, a, a Western farmer hand-pollinating his canola crop. Um, so we need to make sure this doesn't happen anywhere else. So we need to look after our bees. And what can we do to look after them? Well, the good news is you can do lots to look after them. So lots of conservation stories are really depressing. You know, and, and you hear about the rainforests are being chopped down or the, the polar bears are going to have no ice left and, or whatever. And you, don't think, you, do, you, do, you feel helpless. What can you do? Um, but with bees, you can all do something um, uh, because they live all around us. And little things you can do in your garden or in your local area really help. Um, in the UK, I started a, a charity. Um, or I'm not suggesting you join a UK charity for bees, I'm, but I'm going to talk about some of the things that they do. Um, I started it because I was fed up with doing science and just, just communicating with scientists. So normally, if you're a scientist, um, you publish your, your research in scientific paper, uh, papers, in journals, obscure, boring journals, which are read by the other five or ten people in the world that are interested in bumblebees and that are also scientists. Um, and I, I, sa I said this at a conference, to, to a science conference, and, and one of them piped up and said, well, actually, we don't read them either, which was <laughs> one of those... So, so I thought, right, we need to do something else. Um, and, and we need to actually change things. We need to put more flowers back. We need to reduce pesticide use. We need to do something because uh, just writing more papers isn't going to help. So we started a, a, a charity which has gone really well. Um, I guess the nearest equivalent here would be the Xerxes Society who are very good. Um, it's in, this particular charity now has about 9,000 members and 18 staff and offices all over Britain and, and it's created lots of habitat for bees. What I'm just going to talk to you about, the things that it does uh, or that anyone can do um, to help our bees. So firstly, the biggest, most grand thing you might do, um, if you happen to have a meadow, um, which I guess most of you don't, sadly, but um, is, is, is to try and cre recreate a, a flower-rich habitat uh, of the type we used to have so many of, or of different types in different parts of the world. Um, and th so A Buzz in the Meadow, my second book, is about um, me buying a little farm down in, in France, which it, when I bought it was just an arable field that had you know, been farmed in the usual way with no wildlife at all. And 12 years later is, is full of flowers and butterflies and bumblebees and everything else. It's, it's still got a way to go. It's not perfect by any means. Um, it's a complicated business recreating one of these grasslands and it takes, takes a long time and isn't probably practical for most people. Um, uh, but there are lots of other things you can do if you don't have a field. Uh, the very simplest thing you can do is, is just tell people about this. So I said right at the beginning that most people think there's only one species of bee. Well, obviously, the, the more people that are aware that actually it's a bit more complicated than that, there's lots of different species, and they're all important, um, then, then that, that's got to be good. Because if people don't know something exists, they're not going to care about it if it disappears. Um, so anything we can do to spread the word, um, and obviously, so, Things like uh, articles in the newspapers are really effective. So um, when we launched this thing, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, we managed to get the, uh, a newspaper called The Independent, which is a national UK newspaper, um, to put it on the front page. And, then this, and also all of the, the second and third pages were all about bumblebees and their declines and what we can do to help and the launch of this charity. There's 190,000 people that day, if they bothered to read it, um, would have found out something about wild bees and, and what they do and, and what, what we can do for them. Um, so there's lots of ways that we can spread the word. 
Um, writing my books is uh, me standing here now, obviously, are oh, two other ways. Um, I think it's really important to, to engage with kids early on. Um, I find it really depressing. So, so little E.O. Wilson once said that um, every child goes through a bug period, but that he just didn't grow out of his. Um, and there's probably a few people here that, that feel the same. I, I do. But the sad reality is that most kids do grow out of their bug phase. And by the time they're teenagers, if they hear something buzzing or see something scurrying, they tend to want to squash it or they're frightened of it. And they think it's a wasp and it's going to sting them and so on. And I don't know, something has gone wrong from when they were six or seven or eight to when they were uh, 15. And we, could, we need to do something about that, I think. Um, this, these pictures are a before and after. So at the top there, these, these are a group of... I can't remember, there were seven or eight um, primary school kids in Scotland. Uh, and we've developed this lesson about bumblebees to teach them all about how cool they are and the interesting things they do and so on. Um, and at the beginning, we asked them, before we've taught them anything, we asked them to draw a bumblebee. And they draw these blobby things with yellow and black stripes, like I mentioned earlier, pretty hopelessly inaccurate biologically. Two hours later, um, we get them to do it again. And they draw much better pictures of bumblebees because they've learned all about them. But not that that matters in the slightest. But look, look at this blonde kid here. Look at how bored he was at the start. And look at how he is two hours later, <laughs> having learned all about bumblebees. He's ecstatically happy. And hopefully, he will remember those two hours. And, and when he's a teenager, he won't swat the bumblebee that buzzes past him. Well, here's hoping, anyway. Um, there are citizen science projects that you can join in. Um, there are lots in the UK, but there are some going on in various parts of the US as well. Um, it, I'm sure if you look on the internet, you can probably find more, but there's certainly one I'm aware of called Bumblebee Watch, um, where you can take photographs and upload them, um, so photographs of any bumblebees uh, you find in your area, and, and that helps as part of a big mapping project across the US to detect re uh, changes in the, in the distributions of bees. We, we've launched a new citizen science club in the UK where we're trying to get a really detailed long-term monitoring program going up where we're counting the numbers of, getting people to count numbers of bees in one way or another in their gardens. Um, and I'm hopeful that maybe one day that might spread to become a, an international project, but who knows. The final thing, the obvious thing that you can do is you can garden in a wildlife-friendly way. If you have a garden, if you have even a tiny garden or even just a window box, if you plant some bee-friendly flowers, the bees will come. Um, they'll find you in the middle of a city uh, and you'll be doing your bit. You'll be providing them with some food. And I haven't got time to go into all the kind of, you know, um, do's and don'ts of wildflower gardening, but um, just a, a broad thing. Um, so, so lots of people buy these annual bedding plants begonias, petunias, busy lizards, and so on. In the spring, from the garden center, in a plastic disposable tray, you throw away the tray, you plant them in your garden. They're hideously colorful for, for most of the year. Um, horrible, horrible things. I don't know why anyone would want them. Um, they have these huge flowers with lots of bright colors. They've been selected for this, but they've lost their original purpose. You don't see insects going anywhere near these things. Usually they've lost their nectar or their pollen. They've got extra sets of petals instead of stamens, um, all the insects just can't get into them because they're so deformed. Um, flowers evolve to attract an, uh, uh, insects to pollinate them. And if these don't do that, then they're useless. They've lost their original purpose in life. And I think they're, they're a travesty. Um, sorry, I'm, la I'm laboring the point. Um, they're also almost certainly been drenched in pesticides before you bought them. Um, so don't buy them. Um, get rid of them. And gnomes as well. Well, the gnomes, not really. Anyway. Um, uh, and grow some traditional kind of cottage garden flowers. Now, these are UK examples. I, I guess most of them are probably av available here. I'm not suggesting you go for UK ones especially, but the garden flowers we tend to grow here and there are probably largely similar. But there are loads to choose from, and there are endless sources of advice on good plants for, for bees and other pollinators um, in your garden. And these things are mostly perennials, so you only need to buy them once, um, uh, and they'll, they'll stay forever. They're pretty much pest-free, no trouble at all. You don't need to do anything but just watch the happy bees coming in, feeding on them. They look after themselves. And you can have an absolutely beautiful garden um, without any pesticides. Um, just by growing the right kinds of flowers, it'll be alive with insects. Um, you can also squeeze in a few wildflowers. These are obviously British wildflowers. They're endless, lovely North American wildflowers. 
And some people think that wildflowers are weeds and they're going to take over their garden, but they're not. Um, of, of course, all flowers once were wildflowers. There are a few plants that are, will take over your garden, um, but the vast majority you can grow alongside your, your other um, uh, garden varieties and they'll be absolutely happy and no trouble at all. Okay, um, one other thing you can easily do, um, bumblebee nest boxes don't tend to work very well, but solitary bee hotels, they're often called, um, work brilliantly. Um, you can buy them from a garden center, um, or you can make them for nothing at all. Um, this really ugly one I made is, is just a fence post that I drilled some holes in. Um, eight millimeter drill bit, I don't know what that is. You don't deal in millimeters when you're doing drill bits, I don't think, but anyway. Um, uh, just drill a bunch of holes in a block of wood, any shape or size you like, and, and put it out in a sunny place. And within 20 minutes of my drilling those holes, I had these osmia bees, which you also have over here, turning up and investigating and starting nesting in one of the holes. And they really work beautifully well. And again, and these, the, the, so these solitary bees that I mentioned right at the beginning, that, that don't live in a hive, they, many of them will happily nest in these. And it really works to put one in your garden. Your kids will love it. Be able to watch these things coming and going. They fill up the holes and then went with their pollen, and then they plug it with mud at the end of the hole, so you can see when the bees have been there. Uh, and the grubs live inside and then hatch out the next spring. The bottom ones are leaf cutter bees, which you also have over here, which line the tubes with with little discs of leaves that they cut from plants. Very lovely. Okay, so to finish off, um, it isn't actually just about bees. Bees are, I think, are a really nice kind of foot in the door to talk to people about general issues of looking after the environment. And it's very easy to explain to people, even people who aren't normally that interested in nature, that bees are important because they do something tangible for us, pollinating. But of course, actually, other species do things for us. It's not always quite so obvious what they do for us, but there's just a few examples there, things like natural enemies that help to mop up pests of crops, dung beetles and, uh, and wood lice that help to break down organic matter and recycle nutrients, worms that look after the soil and so on. All of these things are vitally important to us. Um, and um, I find it terribly depressing that so few people uh, really care or this is, so many people are detached from nature. Um, anyway, what I would say to you to finish off is that um, bees have been quietly pollinating our crops for the last 10,000 years since we started growing crops. For all of that time, We've given them no thanks whatsoever. We've just taken their services for granted. But there is a real danger that those services are going to disappear, that those bees are going to disappear. And we all need to do something to help them. So if you can just do one of the things that I've talked about, um, and if we can get everyone to do one of those things, then, then we could turn cities into big kind of bee nature reserves. Um, and not just for bees, but for all these other creatures as well. And it would really make a difference. OK, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. How many bees are there in the world? How many s types of bee? There are about 20,000 different types. How many individual bees? I really haven't got a clue, but it'd be an awful lot. Um, so yeah, 20,000 different species that we know of, but I bet you if you went and flapped a net around in some nice tropical country, there would be lots that no one's yet discovered. So maybe you could um, do that later in, later in life. Discover your own bee. What's the range of a bumblebee in, in good living condition? They, they usually stay within, within uh, a mile or so of their nest. They can go further if they really have to, but they, they prefer to be, um, you know... They, they actually, they'll go to the nearest patch of flowers they can find, and they only go long distances when they're stuck for flowers, but usually within a mile and a half at most. I did, did do homing experiments with bumblebees many years ago where I took them in my car and dropped them different distances from home. And the, the one got back from 10 miles away, but, um, but most didn't from 10 miles away. So they just remained lost forever wandering around the countryside, I guess, poor thing. I did... Um, it's surprising how much stuff has just appeared. I, I did um, d um, sow some different mixes in small portions of it. The, it's really expensive to buy, I and mean, it's, th it's 33 acres, and to buy enough wildflower seed to sow the whole lot would have cost a fortune. So I sowed some little patches, um, and I'm hoping that they'll spread. Um, but mostly it's just coming on its own. Um, 
there are ways of speeding it up. I mean, the, the, probably the cheapest thing you can do, um, if you have got a meadow, is, is a popular technique in Britain anyway, is to use green hay. So if you know someone who's got a nice flowery meadow nearby, you just fresh cut, the, you just cut, cut it when it's setting seed and just um, spread the, the, the freshly green cuttings all over your, your field. And obviously the seeds drop in and some of them will establish. And that doesn't, if you've got a friendly neighbor with a nice flowery meadow, which is obviously the sticking point, if that doesn't exist, then it, you can't do it. But if you have, then often they'll give it you for free. But it's a slow, it's, have, have, read in the book, it's, 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 I give the de details of what I've done in, uh, at some length. But uh, um, it, it, there are lots of ways of doing it, but it's slow. And you've got to be patient. I was curious about the research that you did about the bees being able to tell whether another bee was at the flower. Can you say more about how you figured that out? Yeah. Um, so to start with, we... we it, is, it would get a very boring story if I went through the whole thing, but um, to start with, we looked to see if the flowers that they were mi avoiding had less food in, um, and we found that they did, um, so that we, w they were doing something clever. Somehow they were working out which ones were empty. So we thought, well, okay, maybe they, c th maybe they can just smell if there's a lot of nectar there, uh, and if there isn't, they don't bother landing. So we artificially added nectar to em t empty flowers, and that didn't make bees land. Um, if, if, so if a flower had recently been emptied by a bee and then we added more nectar to it, bees would still avoid it. So we, could, we knew it wasn't, they weren't directly measuring the reward. So we, in the end, more by a sort of, it being the only, the only possibility, we thought, well, maybe they can somehow smell where the bees have been. So we, start, we started basically washing bees and putting the, the, the the odor of the bees onto flowers artificially to see if that mimicked the effect, and it, it does really well. If you basically take the kind of essence of bee foot and sprinkle it on the flowers, um, the other bees won't visit it, not surprisingly, when I put it like that, but. Um. I thank you. Um, you mentioned that bumblebees have distributed across the world, and you mentioned that, well, like, what areas would you say are deficient in, like, evidence or, like, data for, like, bumblebees in certain parts of the world? Like, that either need the most outreach, you think that, like we hear a lot about like the UK and the United States, for instance, but like what about the other areas? Yeah, that about we, don't, we have no clue really what's going on in play. I mean, the, the sad thing is, it, it, so that, those pictures I showed of the people hand pollinating, that's really close to the place I pointed to on the map where, where we think they came from originally, where the most species of bumblebee live. We actually haven't really got a clue what's happening in Asia. And particularly China, you know, it's a vast country, but it's really hard to get in, and nobody's, um, you know, really studying what's going on. They obviously, they don't have kind of, you know, citizen scientists counting bees or anything. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a big unknown. And, that, and actually, I mean, as soon as you get into kind of Eastern Europe and beyond eastwards, we haven't really got a clue what's happening. We've got good data for Western Europe and, and North America, and after that, um, South America is also it's largely unstudied. Unstu okay, thank you. Hello again. Are ladybugs endangered? Are any bugs endangered? I, yes, um, lots. I mean, we know of quite a few that have gone extinct. Um, I'm no expert on what North American beasties have gone extinct, but uh, apart from the, the bumblebee I mentioned earlier, um, Franklin's bumblebee, which was last seen in 2006, and used to live on the California Oregon border, but seems to have disappeared. Um, in Britain, we've, we've lost um, quite a few species um, that have gone extinct. Um, things like butterflies, people tend to notice when they go. Um, and I think I'm right in saying, in just in Britain alone, we've lost six species of butterfly. Um, so they're, yeah, they're disappearing slowly. I mean, it's r this is really depressing, but um, th it's, it's calculated that fi globally species are going extinct at about a thousand times the rate they did before we came along. Um, you know, thanks to all the things we're doing to the world. The question was specifically about ladybugs. Oh, sorry, I just heard the word bug. Ladybugs, sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know, I don't know. Does anyone know about ladybugs? Ladybirds? No? 
Sorry, I have no idea. I can tell you what, one thing that's terrible that's happening in Britain with ladybugs, um, because um, some foolish person accidentally introduced a, a, um, a Japanese um, uh, ladybird to, to Britain, where I live. Um, and it, it's very pretty, but it turns out that it, it loves to eat other ladybirds. Um, and it's, it's eating its way through all of the British ladybirds as, uh, as we speak and causing, it's probably going to drive loads of those to extinction, sadly. But I don't think you have that here yet. Thank you. So um, when I see a bumblebee on the ground in the summer and it's barely moving, you mentioned something earlier. Is that one I should feed it some nectar yeah, water? Give it. Give it some sugar. Um, I mean, it might not work because it might have a disease. It might have been poisoned. But um, you know, you can't fix those things. But but if it's just run out of energy, then you can. So yeah, give it give it some sugar water, and uh, very often they they ten minutes later they zoom off, and you can feel really smug. <laughs> I also have a question. So, as some types of bees are dying, are there new types coming in to replace them, or maybe some that would uh, be, you know, more suited to the new environments or uh, immune to some of the chemicals? Uh, not really. Um, certainly, not none. None have become resistant to to the chemicals we use yet. Pests that we don't want to become resistant seem to come resistant. Um, but bees breed much more slowly, so they're, they're, they haven't done that yet. Um, what we have seen, in, I, I, I guess it would be true here, is in, in Britain, we've got some new species have colonized the south of Britain as it's got warmer um, in the last 30 years. So we have acquired a few extra species that, that used to just live in, you know, in France and have now hopped into into Britain, and now there must be some examples, I don't know them, but I'm sure in the US, um, somewhere like this, you, you're probably getting some species that used to live a bit further south, moving northwards. Um, so I, I guess you could see that there are some minor benefits of climate change in that respect, but obviously uh, the, the overall effect is not good. Thank you.